good to see everybody tonight. Along with everybody, we've got a couple of special guests with us. Rachel McReynolds. This is uh, a sister to Linda Morrow. And also, uh, Linda's dad, Bob Morrow, is with us also. So we're glad to have our guests with us tonight, along with everyone else at midweek Bible study time. As we pray together tonight, let's remember Frank Felber, also Lawanda Gray's nephew, uh, who passed away and his girlfriend passed away in a car, car wreck. Remember those families in our prayers. Jerry Broadhead is sick, possibly with COVID. Heather Freeman, Sandy Cannon is awaiting biopsy results and her biopsy went well. We got all kinds of problems in the world, hurricane in Haiti, floods in Helen, Georgia and Waverly, Tennessee. Also about 21 people, the last I saw, 21 people drowned in Tennessee and still several missing. Terrorism in Afghanistan. Holly Richardson, Wendell Carricker's uh, neighbor, needs our prayers. Keith Griffith is seriously ill in the hospital with COVID. Rodney Walker came forward asking our, for our prayers last Sunday morning. Are there any other announcements or prayer requests we want to add at this time? Right? Anybody wants to work in Waverly, let Mark know. Or let me know and I'll put you in touch with the right people. Anything else? Carrie Pfizer, so the family of Carrie Pfizer, okay. Okay. All right, anything else tonight? All right, our last two leaders that will help us out tonight, Drew Bartholomew will read scripture, Seth DeVille will lead two songs, and then uh, not so much a lad to leader, um, 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 uh, Brother Ron will lead us in prayer, and then we'll be dismissed to all of our Bible classes. So let's give our attention to these young fellas. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. <laughs> Sorry. I will be reading Psalms 116, verses 1 through 4. Psalms 116, through verses 1 through 4, from the New International Version. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. Amen. I'll be singing Mansion Over the Heart. So let's have the first and last verses through twice. The first and last verses of Mansion Over the Hill about through twice. I'm satisfied with just the cards below, the little silver and little gold. But in that city, when the ransom will shine, I want a gold one and a silver gold and got a mansion just over the hill. In that bright land where we'll never go, and someday yonder we will never wander. We'll walk the streets that are pure as gold. Me, 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 Discouraged, I'm heaven bound. And go 
first a pilgrim and search for city. I'm on a mansion, a rumble and a I'm got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never go. And someday. I'll be singing what a friend we have in Jesus, the first and last verses. What a friend we have in Jesus, the first and last verses. What a friend was all our sins and who bear. What a privilege there will be if we to think to God in prayer. Oh, what, what peace we have with yeah. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Oh, because we do not carry everything. Take it to our Lord in prayer. To God, my friends, this part will take thee. Take it to our Lord in prayer. And it's not to take the shield thee. Thou Roll the mic, I must take exception. I've got Scottish blood in me, and being called a laddie is just part of being me. So me and the guys do what we gotta do, don't we, man? Let's go to the Lord in prayer with thanksgiving. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, creator, sovereign of all the universe, all that we know. God, we thank you for one more day. We pray, Father, that we use the day as good stewards for your glory. We pray that you guide and lead us. We pray, Father, that you grant us strength and endurance that you grant us discernment and understanding because, Father, these are such troubling times, as Brother Mike mentioned. There is heartache and trouble and pain and evil completely around this globe, Father. So often it's enough to be disparaging, but we are told to take heart it's not if we're going to encounter problems, it's when. And right now, Father, in all the various ways we are experiencing problems and heartache. But we have blessed assurance. We have promise. We have hope. Father, Brother Mike just read a prayer request that we have. We heard a spoken request or two. Father, you know our hearts of each one of us. And I can't help believe, Father, but each of us 
has unspoken prayers that tend to trouble us. But Father, we can rejoice knowing that you are in charge. All things are possible through those that love the Lord. So Father, be with each member of our congregation, each family member, each friend, each acquaintance. Be for the leaders, not only of this country, Father, but those in the world that make decisions. Bless the word that we're gonna receive this evening, Father. May you open the eyes and the ears of our hearts that we can apply and be fed on the word that we're about to receive. Father, we ask forgiveness for the sin in our life because we know and believe, Father, that each of us stumbles, each of us falls short. But Jesus, Jesus Christ has redeemed us. Jesus Christ has reconciled us with, with you, O oh God. Forgive us, Father. It's in, that, it's in that name of Jesus Christ that we pray and glorify you, Father. Amen. Amen. So good to see everybody tonight. Let's uh, talk a little bit more about some of the folks on our prayer list tonight. Sandy did have a good biopsy, if, that's a, if that can be good. She's just awaiting for all the results. And, uh, but things went well in uh, collecting the material. Uh, Heather Freeman is very sick and uh, continues to need our prayers. And uh, LaWanda Gray's nephew that perished in his name was Slade Bomer, and he died at age 18, along with his girlfriend. Josh, uh, you have a great aunt that uh, suffered a major stroke. She's paralyzed on her left side. Her name is Otha Lee Hewitt, and her nickname is Dot. Aunt Dot. And she's still not in the hospital. The hospitals are full of COVID, so there's no place for they're treating her as best they can in her home. Uh, Doc is 95 years old. She's a member of the Boulevard Church in Lake Charles. Any, any latest news on that? Yeah, she's just kind of hanging in there. And we'll add these other folks to the prayer list that folks spoke up about a moment ago. Anybody else you can think of right quick? Another one, huh? Chris, can you fix my TV or the screen, whatever? Or is it up to you? The Buckhannon family? That's a cousin. 
cousin of yours? Thank y'all. Appreciate that. Well, have y'all heard about the new COVID vaccine for Louisiana? It's a COVID vaccine just for Louisiana. Here's a, here's a picture of it. I believe that might burn a little bit. What do you think? Might work, though. You know, you know might work. Well, we're trying to finish it up our study of the book of Ecclesiastes. We've made it to chapter 12. Can you believe it? We've made it to the last chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes. And in chapter 11, verse 7, and going through chapter 12, verse 8, uh, give me just a moment, y'all. I, I apologize that uh, I'm trying to get used to these new hearing aids. And I'm just too loud. In my own ears. I've got to turn myself down. Now, when y'all discuss, y'all going to have to speak up extra loud because I just turned my hearing aids down. All right. Sorry about that. It's just taking some getting used to. So in this passage, we're, we're talking about how Solomon has come to uh, his old age and he's looking back on his life. And before he wraps everything up, he wants to give some advice to the young people. And basically, his advice to the young people is embrace life and enjoy it. Enjoy your life. It's okay to enjoy life. Just do it within the proper boundaries. Remember your Creator and remember coming judgment. So enjoy life within healthy boundaries. But do enjoy your youth while you're still young and have the energy to enjoy it. Now notice in chapter 12, verse 1, he says, remember also your Creator in the days of your youth before what? Remember your Creator before what? Before what? You ought to talk louder. Before the difficult times come or the bad times come. And as he describes it in chapter 12, it's the deteriorating of the body in old age. He talks about losing your teeth, and he talks about uh, uh, your losing your eyesight. He talks about losing your hearing and, and all of your senses and faculties. And so he continues that thought in verses five and following. So, Josh, would you have you got it there? Oh, go ahead, Trinity. Read for us verses five through eight. And and he just con he continues the thought. Remember God while you're young. And before you get old, because the older you get, the harder it's going to get to enjoy life. So before all of this stuff happens, verse 5. Yes, sir. Thank you, Trinity. So in verse 5, remember your Creator while you're still young before you get to the point where you're afraid of what's high and you're afraid of what's low. Terrors in your way. Uh, an older person is afraid to go out in public. They're afraid to reach up high for something for fear they might fall. And they're afraid of terrors all along in the way. If somebody runs into an older person, they can knock them down, break their hip, they can hit their head and be knocked out. You, you get older and more feeble and it's hard to even uh, walk without being afraid of falling and hurting yourself. Before the almond tree blossoms, what might that be talking about? What's that? Hair turns white or gray? Yeah, almond blossoms are white. Now, I, I would just love to have white hair, you know. 
I think I'd take purple hair just to have hair. Uh, but uh, if you got hair, it, uh, it turns white. It either turns white or it turns loose, one of the two. And uh, so the apple tree blossoms. Remember your creator before the grasshopper drags itself along. Is that talking about a bad knee or a bad hip? And you just have to get a walker or a cane and have to carry yourself along like a grasshopper leg. And desire fail. Desire failing can be anything from just the general losing the desire and enthusiasm to live. Uh, and it could mean something more specific as perhaps even sexual desire. And all of this is happening, why? Because a man is going to his eternal home. We're getting closer and closer to when we die. And it's kind of comical here. You just got to laugh at everything in life, even getting older. And the mourners go about the streets. Now back in those days, they had professionals who mourn. You would, you would pay for people to show up at your funeral, or your loved ones would pay for people to show up at your funeral and weep and wail and carry on. Uh, and people would think, well, oh, they love him so much because there's everybody weeping and wailing at his funeral. Well, that was part of Middle Eastern culture. It's still part of Middle Eastern culture. Uh, they tend, when they grieve, to really put on a public display of grief and lamenting and weeping and wailing. And more so than in our culture. It's just a cultural thing. And, and so these professional mourners, they're just lurking outside your door, just waiting for you to die so they'll have a payday. I've got a couple of uh, funeral friends who own their own funeral homes. And one of them told me one time, he said, I just quit visiting the hospital. I don't visit the hospital. Because if I visit anybody in the hospital, you know what everybody's thinking. I'm there to pick somebody up. And so I, I, I just don't visit the hospital. And so he said, if you see me at the hospital, you'll know what I'm there for. Because I don't visit friends in the hospital. Well, it's like these mourners are just... They know you're so close to death, they're just waiting for you to die. And that's the way life is. You're going to get old pretty quick. So remember your Creator in the days of your youth, verse 6, before the silver cord is snapped, before the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, and before the wheel is broken at the cistern. Perhaps this is talking about what do you think it might be talking about? These are metaphors or poetic expressions for something. What do you think? Yeah, these things are breaking or shattering or snapping, and so you're just kind of, you know, snap, crackle, and pop when you get up in the morning and uh, stuff's breaking as you get older. And, and so it may refer to uselessness. Now, we know nobody is useless, but a person in their old age may feel useless. Or it may even refer to dying. Uh, these may be idiomatic expressions, euphemisms for dying. What are some of our euphemisms in our culture for dying? Kicking the bucket. Circling the drain. That's getting close to dying, right? Which way does the drain circle in Louisiana? Does it go, does it go clockwise? And where does it go counterclockwise? The other side of the equator? It goes south of the equator, it'll circle the other. I'm not making this up, this is true. Okay, so circling the drain, what else? You ever heard of pushing up daisies? He bought the farm. Or he kicked the bucket, I like that one. He croaked. You know, there's all kinds of ways. And maybe that's what verse 6 is. It's just different ways of saying, and then you die. Because the very next verse, verse 7 says, and then the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. All is vanity, because you just, you live, you get old, and you die. But, so there is no, there's not a lot of meaning in this physical life.
But there is meaning if you understand that there is life after this life. And so that's the only thing that makes life worth living is a hope for the next life when our spirit returns to God and then hopefully on to live with God for all eternity. So here's a discussion question. What are some specific ways that older Christians can live life to the fullest while still honoring God? The main thrust of this passage is about how young people ought to enjoy life before they get old, and it's a little harder to enjoy life when you get old. But we should not think from this lesson that older people can't have fun and enjoy life. Uh, Older folks can enjoy life too and live life to the fullest. It just gets harder. You have to be more intentional about it. But you can enjoy life to the fullest while still honoring God. Tell me how. What are some specific ways? You can be an example and show the way. You, you've got some wisdom. You don't get to be old being completely dumb. You know, you, you got to have learned something along the way if you get to be really old and, and you can share some knowledge with people. When David got old, they called him the Lamp of Israel. We all know the children's version of Jesus Loves Me. Would y'all like to sing the senior's version of Jesus Loves Me? Would you sing it with me? Jesus loves me, this I know. Though my hair is white as snow, though my side is growing dim, still he bids me trust in him. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Y'all can do better than that. All right? Let the folks watching online hear you singing that. Everybody sing out. Though my steps are oh so slow, with my hand in his I'll go. On through life, let come what may, he'll be there to lead the way. We won't do the chorus every time. Though I am no longer young, I have much which he's begun. Let me serve Christ with a smile. Go with others the extra mile. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. When the nights are dark and long, in my heart he puts a song, telling me in words so clear, have no fear for I am near. When my work on earth is done, and life's victories have been won. He will take me home above, then I'll understand his love. I love Jesus, does he know? Have I ever told him so? Jesus loves to hear me say that I love him every day. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. So even, even though the main point of this passage is young people enjoy life before you get old, don't think that he's saying you can't enjoy life when you're older. Jesus still loves you even when you get old. Keep singing, Jesus loves me, this I know. But the big idea of the passage is for young people to embrace life and to enjoy life as a gift from the Creator. God gave us our blessings. He gives us our breath, our life, 
all of the blessings that we enjoy in this world, and especially our spiritual blessings, and one of the main reasons He blesses us is for pure enjoyment. He wants to see His children enjoy the blessings that He has given them. It's got to be insulting to the Creator God to bless us so richly and then for us to not to enjoy those gifts and blessings. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul gives us two reasons why God has blessed us. One reason God has blessed us and provided for us is that we might enjoy what He has given us. He richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Every age group, and the other reason we'll look at in a minute from 1 Timothy, is that we might use the blessings that He's given us to bless others. He's blessed us to enjoy those blessings and to use them to bless others. Every age group needs to hear this message in Ecclesiastes 11 and 12. At every stage of life, young and old alike, we need to embrace and enjoy the life that God has given us. Now don't feel like you have to get down everything on this screen at once because we'll go back over these one at a time in a little detail. But just to sum up what we're going to do the next few minutes is make these applications. Live life to the fullest. To the fullest, enjoy your life. Enjoy life without guilt. You don't have to feel guilty that you are blessed. Enjoy your blessings. Three, teach younger people the truths of this passage. That's mostly what Solomon is saying. Teach the younger people to remember their Creator in the days of their youth. And number four, you get one shot at each stage of life. Enjoy every stage of life to its fullest. Now let's talk about those. Number one, live life to the fullest. If I were talking to young people tonight, I would say limit your screen time. Life is passing you by while you're looking at the phone or the computer screen or the video game or the tablet. Get out of that screen. and Get outside and do something. Take a hike. Live adventurously within your means. If you don't have the money to take a trip around the world, then don't take a trip around the world. Find an adventure in Louisiana. Live within your means to and live adventurously. If you've got the money to take a cruise around the world, don't feel guilty about that. Take a cruise around the world. Enjoy it. Live adventurously. And do it all with Christian friends. People who will keep you in the circle of, of God and His love and His commandments. And if you ever stray outside that circle, your Christian friends will call you back into that circle. Do all of this enjoying of life with friends of yours who share the same Christian worldview that you do. Number two, enjoy life without guilt. God created this world for our enjoyment. Look at the creation. You know, the, the Psalms say, the firmament showeth His handiwork. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament shows His handiwork. Just look at all the creation of God. It's not bland, is it? It's not gray and black and white. Look at the beauty and the color and the diversity of life, plant and animal life upon this planet. Think of it. Do you ever watch any of those uh, animal documentaries on TV that, that go to the depths of the oceans and the top of the tallest mountains and show you all those beautiful animals in in, in HD and 4K HD, Ultra TV, and you see the beauty and the wonder and the diversity. Why did God make so much, so many different things and so diverse? It's got to be that one of them is so that we'd enjoy it. A, col a colorful, beautiful world. And He gave us five senses to enjoy it. So we can look at it and we can hear it and, and we can and we can feel it, and we can smell it, and stuff that smells good, and we can even taste some of it. Think about all the different flavors God blesses us with in this world. Aren't you glad that, you, you know, 
God made cornbread. <laughs> Peas and cornbread. And uh, homegrown cream style corn. And some Vidalia onions. I don't even have to have meat. If I, got, if I got peas and cornbread and corn and onions, I don't even have to have meat. That's a meal right there. And God is a great God who gave us all of this to enjoy it. We don't have to feel guilty about that as long as we enjoy it within the right moral parameters and borders. Now, here's the other reason in 1 Timothy 6, Paul says God is blessed. First reason he said, God has blessed us that we might enjoy it. The second reason is that we might use it to bless others. 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 18 says, Do good, be rich in good works, be generous, and be ready to share. Enjoy what you got without guilt and share it with other people. And then the next one is teach younger people the truths of this passage. And that's the main thrust of Solomon at the end of this book. Teach these truths to the younger people. So younger Christians, how can the older generation help you find meaning in a meaningless world? As you look to the older folks in the church, how can they help you find meaning? So I think what I hear Erica saying is to the older Christians is don't wait for us to ask. If you see that we're going through something or we need to hear something from you, give us that word. Speak that word to us. Now are you going to get mad when they do? You may get mad, but you'll get over it. There you go. Yes, sir. Right. So, older folks can show the younger folks what's really important, what our priorities should be. Here's something I copied down. Younger people need to hear the older generations tell them that it is God honoring to enjoy their life. I'm afraid sometimes, whether older folk intended it or not, younger folk heard a message of older folk trying to take the joy out of life. Trying to suck the joy out of you. So we got to be careful, those of us who are older, in trying to advise the younger that we don't come across with that impression. And that we impress upon younger people, yes, you are supposed to enjoy your life, but in a God-honoring way. But also, Older folk need to help the younger folk hear the hard warnings also in this passage about aging, death, and coming judgment. So it's got to be balanced. And sometimes people hear what they want to hear, but we have to be careful in communicating that we communicate with balance. Does that make sense? 
And then finally, you get one shot at each stage of life. You only get one shot at your teens. You only get one shot at your 20s and your 30s. And, you know, I had people tell me when I was a teenager, you're, you're going to want these years back. So make the most of it. And boy, were they right. And if I could go back and do my, my teens over, if I could go back and do my 20s over, I'd do some things different. Don't waste the one shot you've got at each stage of your life. Find a way at every stage to give God the glory. And if you didn't do that in your previous decades of life, then don't fret over spilled milk. Put that behind you and move on from it. And make the most of the rest of your life on the earth, giving glory to God. Don't waste the one shot at each stage of life that God's given you. I love Paul's attitude in Philippians. Paul's uh, writing during his first Roman imprisonment. He's about to stand before the emperor, and he doesn't know how the trial is going to turn out. He may be exonerated and set free, or he may be beheaded. And as it turns out, he was set free this first time. Second Roman imprisonment, Nero will behead him. But this time, he, he doesn't know how it's going to turn out. And he says, well, for me to live is Christ, and for me to die is gain. So Paul's okay with it either way. If I die, I just get to go and be with the Lord. And I'll be better off. But if I live, that's Christ. And in chapter 1, verse 22, he says, if I'm to continue living in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. If I get to keep on living in the flesh, that just means more time to bear fruit for God. For me to bear fruit in God's kingdom. He was an older man at this point, but he was going to take advantage. If he's set free from prison, he's going to take advantage of the time that he's given to keep bearing fruit. Paul, Paul never retires from the church. He never retires from serving God. He keeps on bearing fruitful labor for the Lord every stage of life. Let's think about the four seasons of life uh, in, in terms of the springtime being the youth of our lives and how enjoyable that is, especially if you've got a good family. These children don't know how good they've got it, do they? They've every, they've, every meal is provided for them. Their clothes are provided for them. Their shelter. They don't know how good they got it. What is that about us that we don't know what we got till it's gone? We don't know how to really appreciate our blessing till they're gone. And then you get to the summer of life. This is your prime of life. You're really producing. Don't forget to produce for God during the summer of life. Don't say in the spring of life, when I get to the summer of life, when I get to be an adult, then I'll get serious about serving God. Because if you do that, you'll get to the summer of life and say, well, I'm too busy working and taking care of my family. I'll wait till I'm retired. Then you'll get to the fall of life, something else will come on you, like sickness, or old age, or whatever. Then we get to the winter of life. The leaves start falling off. The sap starts drying up. And we see the end approaching. We don't have the energy we had back in the spring and the summer. And we'll regret that we didn't use that time of life to really bear fruit for God. Take advantage of every season of life. Because one thing we know about the seasons of life is that they're quickly passed. They're swiftly passed. Take full advantage of time and opportunity to serve God right now in whatever stage of life you find yourself. Any other comments about taking advantage of the meaning of life whatever age you find yourself? Well, let's move on then to the conclusion of Ecclesiastes. 
It's chapter 12, verses 9 through 14. Josh, have you got that one? Brother, you're going to have to get on it now. I keep coming back to you. Yes, sir. Chapter 12, verses 9 through 14. Thank you, Brother John. So, your translation calls him the teacher. My translation calls him the preacher. And uh, that is Kohelet in the Hebrew text. And we believe that to be Solomon. And so either Solomon is the author of the book of Ecclesiastes, referring to himself in the third person when he calls himself Kohelet, the preacher or the teacher. Or Solomon wrote much of this book and some later author then uses it and calls Solomon's writings the teachings of the preacher or the teacher. But at any rate, Solomon's fingerprints are all over this book. And so at the end, uh, as Josh just read it for us, we see the conclusion with some final thoughts where we have the collection of Proverbs written by Solomon or collected by Solomon, and then the conclusion of this whole book. So think about the collection here of all of Solomon's Proverbs, not just here, but in the book of Proverbs as well. The information that he's referencing here in verse 9, the teacher, Kohelet, the preacher, collected and classified. He wrote many of the Proverbs. Some of them he collected from other cultures and classified them and put them in the book of Proverbs. And, and, and they're used in this writing, the book of Ecclesiastes as well. Then we see the instruction of the teacher or preacher. He taught these to his people. He didn't just collect them and write them, but he he taught them in verse 10. They were words of delight. And uprightly he wrote these. And then he taught them like goads or like nails firmly fixed. So what is the idea of those metaphors of of a goad? What, what is a goad? I've already showed you what it is. But what's it used for? Have you ever heard of an ox goad? Or a cattle prod? It's just a sharp stick to, not to hurt the livestock, but to guide them along and to motivate them if they need a little motivation to go or get in a little bit of a hurry. Some of these goads are just sticks sharpened with a point. Others are very elaborate from ancient times, made out of metal, but they're to to guide the the cattle along. And then the Proverbs and teachings of Solomon, the instructions of Solomon, are also like firmly fixed nails from one shepherd. So how are the teachings of Solomon like an ox goad or a cattle should be obvious, right? They guide us. And there might even be a, a, a rebuking nature to them. Or a, I mean, it's, it's not to hurt us, but, it, but the words of the Lord through Solomon can make us uncomfortable. And sometimes that's the purpose of the Word of God, is to make us uncomfortable, to motivate us. How are the instructions of Solomon like Firmly fixed nails. <coughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
It's fixed. Right. So life and death are certain. They're fixed. And also the word of the Lord through Solomon or through whomever is being guided by the Spirit. Scripture is firmly fixed. It's true. And we can count on it. We can depend on it. We can rely on it to give us what we need to know. To know how to serve God. A lot of ways you can think of it being like an, a goad or, or like firmly fixed nails. But then he talks about all of these books. He said, son, you can, you can read further. And when he says, my son, beware of anything beyond these, of making many books, there's no end, and much studies of weariness of the flesh. This language of my son, that's just the typical language of wisdom literature of the ancient Near East. Not just in Israel, but uh, wisdom literature from Babylon and Assyria and Egypt. Uh, it, it's, it's couched in terms of a father addressing a son. But it's not just for a son. It's just wisdom for everybody. So he's saying, you can read more books. You can read and read and write and write and read and read and wear your flesh out. But I'm telling you, here's the end of the whole thing. Here's the conclusion of the whole thing. It's not that there's not value in reading. There can be great value in reading. But what's in God's Word is what's fixed and, and, and is the best reading and what you really need to know. And, and this is it right here. I'm going to give you... I mean, you can read for the rest of your life and not get anything better than this right here. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. That's the conclusion of this study. That's the conclusion of everything Solomon tried in his life. He's young, and now he's old. And he's tried all these different ways to find meaning, and they were all meaningless. Except for fearing God and keeping His commandments. So what's the conclusion? What are we to do? Fear God and keep His commandments. Why? What's that? That is the whole duty of man and also because God will judge us for everything we do. Verse 14, God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. This life on this earth is not all there is. Life, you've heard about the circle of life. That's a beautiful song from the Lion King and all of that. But life is not just a circle. Life is also linear. It is headed in a linear fashion to a conclusion. This earthly life is headed to a conclusion. And then the Spirit lives on forever. The only question is, Jeff, it's like real estate. The only question is location, location, location in this life. Where will we be after judgment? So what do you think? Here's the conclusion. If you read Ecclesiastes one way, it's pretty negative and pessimistic. But does it end on a positive note? What do you think? You think so? Why is this a positive way to end this book? Puts everything in its proper place. It's not so pessimistic when you realize that, okay, if you fear God and kept His commandments, you're going to be okay after this one.
Very good. Very good. Good comment. Ultimately, we are not going to find satisfaction in this life. We can find some enjoyment. And where we can find wholesome enjoyment, we should embrace it. But we're never going to find ultimate satisfaction on this earth. That's for heaven. So, beyond the sun, we will find ultimate satisfaction. So while we're living this life with all of its enjoyable moments, as well as all of its frustrating moments, if we keep looking to eternity, and keep fearing God and keeping His commandments, everything's going to be okay in the end. In fact, it's going to be better when we get beyond the sun. Get on into eternity. That's the conclusion. That's the end. That's the message. If we're not fearing God and keeping His commandments, if we're not looking to eternity, everything under the sun is vain and futile and worthless. But if we're looking to eternity, there's meaning in our whole life. Right? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for each one here tonight. We pray, Father, You'll bless our reading and discussing of Your Word. Help us to continue to contemplate on it throughout the night and the coming days. May it help us to grow more mature. We're mindful, Father, of so many folks that we've called out tonight on our prayer list. And we pray that You'd suit to them the blessings in an individual way that each one needs the most. We pray You'd help those in the hospital to be able to come home okay if it be Your will. That You would supply every need of those who are, who are aged and suffering from ailments. You'd help them to find peace. That You'd help those who are discouraged and facing challenges to lean on You in all of the suffering that they're enduring. For those who are grieving, might they not grieve as those who have no hope, but as those who do have hope. And help them find peace and comfort in You. Bless those who are awaiting uncertain outcomes and news. We pray, Father, You'd help them to cast their anxieties on You and be like the Apostle Paul and, and resolve to be content either way when the news falls. We know, Father, that all things will work together for us for good if we keep loving You. Thank You for this great promise of Your divine providence. In the name of Your holy and righteous Son, Amen.